just a little bit more until you get to the after party. Just we'll talk less. Let me ask some questions first. Who is the Scala developer here? Oh, okay, okay, two. I expected some more. Oh, four. Oh, great. So you will see a lot of familiar code in here um, with your reactor. But yeah. One other question. Who is you who has used Java 8 already? You close here? Okay. Okay. I have to admit that or by intention actually uh, I'm using a lot of Java 8 code here. Um, just to show how nice Java can also look like, and it fits much better on the slides than Um But it's t um, Java 6 compatible, so just create um, anonymous classes, as we'll see later in the demo. I also have to admit that I'm a very demo-ish guy, so I only have a few slides, and even some of those slides contain code, and then we'll switch over to live coding, because I think it's much more fun. So who's that guy speaking? Um, my name is Michael Nitsching, actually I live in Vienna, but um, I think maybe some of you are not, uh, don't understand German that well, so I just keep talking in English and I can practice as well. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you like, um, I Sasha. And I'm also contributing to Reactor and Betty. And by the way, my main job is working on Couchbase. Um, I'm maintaining the Java SDK there. And as it happens to be as part of my work there, we're looking for very high performance, low latency JVM code. And React is a pretty good fit, as you'll see in a minute. So, what 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 is React for? I mean, it's kind of a buzzword right now. Like cloud, it's not so 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 buzzy, but but still. Um, has anyone heard of the Reactive Manifesto before? Oh, two, three, great. For those who haven't, check it out. It's it's really nice. What is it about? It's not about a specific te technology. It's about how to build applications, not even web applications, applications and architectures that allow you to scale in a very, very, or that allow you to scale up and down very, very easily, that can react to to, to user loads, to, to events, all these kind of things. And it's also, it's, it's not so much important to think about this web scale and I have, want to have it run on thousands of servers. Even if, if you think about on a mobile device, battery power is very precious and you want to make sure that you only execute that amount of code um, that you have to in a very efficient manner. So reactive applications, the, the name implies reactive, which means there is something that reacts to, to an event. And there are four main properties of reactive applications that, that you should think about. The first one is event driven. And this is the, 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 the basic, but let, let's first talk about what, what events mean. So if you think about a reactive application, event driven means reacting to events, but we also need to react to, to user events, so it has to be scalable, and we, we need to react to loads, so it has to be responsive, and we also need to react to failure. And reacting to failure is something that's an afterthought in most of current applications. Oh, we need to handle failure kind of thing. But that's very bad. So we need to also to react to failure in a very predictable manner. And the manifesto talks about four things. So event driven, if, if you build event driven applications and, and really from the ground up event driven applications, what, what, what it will do for you and what you will see in examples later is that it, it allows you to decouple your code in a very, very nice way. Because what you do is you decouple your supplier from your consumer. And it allows you to, to build those consumers that just act to messages sent to you from those suppliers, but they are completely um, decoupled. So it's very easy. And for those of you who have been in the last talk, it's very easy to, to do testing for, for those consumers because they only expect the message and you, you just pass it in those messages. You, you don't have mutable state. And testing mutable state is, is quite hard, even, uh, especially in multi thread applications. What it also allows you to do is, is sharing resources. Because you have those consumers who, who don't know about it in which, in which um, thread they run, they, they just get an event and then they react upon the event. Um, it, it's not defined, okay, it, it only runs on this thread or with this thread and we need to synchronize it, all these kind of properties to make them synchronize properly. So what it allows you to do, and this is the, the care of the underlying uh, library like reactor, you just have your consumer, and but it can happen that you have thousands of consumers on one thread and only when they get a message, they react to the message and actually 
occupy the thread. So you can multiplex, uh, multiplex hundreds or two hundreds of thousands of consumers on one thread, which allow you to, to make the most out of the resources that you have available. And this is especially important in, in multiple environments where you actually really don't know on which thread your consumer gets access to. And of course, the, the basic under, underlying foundation is asynchronous execution, um, which is the, the basis for this process. Scalability, um, I work at Couchbase, I won't talk about Couchbase today, but we see most people going to Couchbase because they need scalability, they have scalability, they don't get the relation databases, but the problem is, here we have our three tired architecture, we, we, everyone knows this, and Couchbase is here at the data being tired, like relation databases, but if your empire doesn't scale, you don't need to look at the data visitor, right? So your application here also needs to, to scale properly. And scaling, again, doesn't only mean scaling up, but also means scaling, scaling back down as well. Even if you're an EC2 or some other, <coughs> some other cloud platform where you're free to pay per usage, if you want to make your cluster smaller as well, it also takes time. So you can really save money. The third one is failure resilience. And I think this is really important because most of our applications that we build currently, failure management, especially with Java, you have you have those try catch blocks and, and you don't really know how to propagate them up and those kind of things. It's, it's very hard to do with reactive applications and those consumers decoupled. What you can do is, if an exception is raised, you, you can catch this exception and just pass it on as another message. And if you build a, a tree architecture like you would do in, in Akka, for example, in Scala, they allow you to basically create, create supervision hierarchy. So you have something at the top, and they con so the consumers are attached on the bottom in, in this tree. And if something fails at the bottom of the tree, you can either choose to handle the error locally, or just populate it up the tree until there is someone there available to really fix your issue. And th this allows you to, to really build failure resilient systems. And it has to be responsive, of course. If you have hundreds or thousands of users at the same time, we need to make sure that the, the website is responsive or the service is responsive to your, to your, to your customers or your users. And the responsiveness is, is just it's just a summary of, of, of the top three here. So, has anyone seen this picture? It has been on the internet some time ago. Yeah. And this is ultimately where we want to go. Think of the, the underlying ship as our thread and the small ships on top as our events that we want to execute, right? And if we, if we get there, that's really efficient to, to carry on ship servers, right? So with, with, that, with that in mind, let's talk about Reactor. What is Reactor? Reactor is a foundational library for your reactive application. And I really want to emphasize that. It's not a library that the end user normally would use. What, what Reactor allows you to do, or what Reactor is, it's basically a foundation for your libraries that people use then. Or if, if you're building very high performance, low, low latency um, services, you can also use this as a foundation. But for example, at Couchbase, what we do is we take Reactor and then we build our SDK on top of it and ship it to users. So we, we don't expose it directly. And it's kind of a gray area between, between user and low level code, as you will see later. Um, but you can certainly en encapsulate it and then ship it and, and provide a much nicer interface. Or that fits your ESL or application code. And it allows you to build your application cores on top of it, especially if you're building drivers, um, libraries, events, architectures, wh where you need most of the time. So where, where there's no boundary, where they, I want to make it as fast as possible and reuse and use as, as, less, as, um, as less resources as possible. It's maintained um, by Spring people or Kiboto, how they are called right now, but it has no dependency on Spring at all. Um, actually, it's Reactor will, will power the, the new Spring architecture at the top, but it has absolutely no um, dependency on Spring whatsoever. It's currently the release candidate stage. We are still trying to, to fix some stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm not maintaining it, I'm, I'm just contributing it. How does the Spring architecture, uh, sorry, the React architecture look like? So Reactor basically has its, its core, um, which only has one dependency, that is the LMAX disruptor. Has anyone heard of the LMAX disruptor before? Yeah, a few were here. It's basically a very, very, very high performance ring buffer that is used in, in high frequency trading and then financial applications. Um, and we, we use the disruptor as a, as a dispatcher to, to <coughs> push milli really millions of events through one JVM with, with, with no issues. 
And on top of that, we, we give you more integration. Okay. We have reactor TCP, which allows you to build um, TCP clients and servers. It's, uh, it's built on top of Nelly 4, which is, I think, the best NIO or IO library on the JVM that you can get right now. Um, and we also have integration for Spring and, and Reactor, but they are separate modules that build on top of the core. And we also have support for uh, Logback, which gives you better logic. So, a, a quick first look. Three things happen here, of course. The first one is you create an environment. And um, it, it's not so important right now, but when you start building applications, uh, make sure to only create one environment uh, because the environment creates your, your threads, um, your different dispatchers, your thread pools, these kind of things that you will reuse later in your reactors and in your promises and, and streams. The next thing we do here is we create a reactor. And the reactor is, is nothing, uh, does nothing more than you, you can add consumers to it that react on events, and then you have um, events that get put into the reactor and the consumers get notified. So you, this is basically, where you've seen it before, this is a Java 8 closure. Um, we, we could also use a, a, a new consumer and create an anonymous class, but it's much more convenient here. So what, what happens here is we have a consumer who registers itself on the, on the topic, which is called topic. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very fancy, but it makes sense. And every time we notify something on the topic, so we send an event to the topic, this consumer gets notified. And we can re register as many consumers as we want to different topics, and it's very flexible. But if you run this code, we get hello John Doe. And the important part here, this consumer basically only takes the event. He knows nothing more. And it gets executed on a thread that he doesn't know. The reactor or the dispatcher, here we use the ring button dispatcher, is responsible for dispatching the event into our consumers and clients. And run them there. So if we change the environment here from ring buffer to thread pool, this one will be run in a thread pool instead. So what kind of dispatchers do we support right now? We have a thread pool dispatcher, which, as the name suggests, creates a thread pool, and your, your consumers and your events will be executed in the thread pool. Then we have a block and queue dispatcher, which is, if, if you know how Netty, Netty 4, for example, works with the event loop that uses internally, it's very event loop style. Then we have the ring buffer dispatcher, which is the most performant one but it's, uh, it runs on a single thread by design. So you want to make sure if you use the ring buffer dispatcher, everything that you do inside your consumers is not blocking because you will block your thread and you will um, suffer in terms of performance. But if you don't block, it's really, really fast. And by fast, I mean literally 10, 10 million operations per second on, on, on the network is passing events through. And then we have a synchronous dispatcher, which you not most of the time want, want to use for testing because it will synchronously uh, execute the event and you can assert on that. So let's talk a little bit about selectors. So this here is the selector. And it, this syntax here is, is really uncommon to, to most of Java developers. Um, it's more familiar to jQuery developers and JavaScript developers. But it's very handy. So if you work with Reactor, it's if you start out, it's really different to, to your normal Java E or, or Spring coding in a way. Um, but if you get used to it, it's, it's really, really nice and good performance. Um, so here we have the topic. Here it's, it's just a string, but a selector can be anything. So we, we, if basically, if you think about it as an equality comparison, it's the left side. So an event gets passed in on a topic, and then we check, hey, does this selector that we gave us match some consumers that are registered to, to this topic? And it can be objects, it can be classes, or, for example, it can be a regular expression. So we register a consumer that gets notified when the regular expression of talking stops, and then wh whatever comes next, but it has to be one, one character, basically, so it's just a regular expression, gets notified. And here we use the, the topic, topic.greet with an event. And of course, this one will be executed because this topic matches the regular expression. And what we can also do is we can take part of the, of the event, so of the selector out there, and react on it in our consumer. So it, uh, I just want to emphasize that it, this kind of, 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 of message notification is very, very uh, flexible. We also support URI templates. So here we have topic, and then we have an identifier here, like a name. Uh, it works exactly the same. 
and we can pick up some issues. This one is just more readable if you have a, a, a simple thing that you want to pick out. And there are much more selectors. Um, this week we, we added the JSON path selector, which is very nice if you are dealing with JSON streams and you want to notify consumer if this substring in the, in the JSON block arrives. So, so it, it's very flexible. I talked about the consumers um, a little bit, but we, we use these four underlying uh, functions to define those interfaces that you can pass in for example, to a reactor, but as we'll also see later, to promises and streams. So we have the consumer, which just has an accept method. Um, it, so it, here, if we wouldn't use Java 8, so we would say new consumer, and this block would be executed in, in the accept method. It just reacts to an event and does nothing, like printing out something or doing something else. But we also have a function, and what a function does, is it takes a value, it transforms it, and then it, it returns the transformed value. Think of it like, I don't have a consumer that prints something out, but I'm using a string to, to uppercase. I get the, the mixed case string, and then I return the uppercase string for the next, the next event in my, in my, uh, in my reactor, we get the uppercase string, so you can change them, change them together. We also have predicates, where you can do things like, oh, if, if this, String is longer than 10 characters, then return true, and then only the next one will be executed. So they are just handy there to share. Um, to, to share. And the supplier is a little different. I just want to mention it here. Uh, we're using a, the supplier pattern um, inside Reactor where a supplier supplies an object. So we, we do, uh, for example, process specs, and then you call get on the spec, and then you get a real process. So it's, it, it's a nice and handy way to. It, it's like build the object. So, promises. Here we create a promise, and it's important to, uh, I just mentioned it here um, quickly. We distinguish between deferred and promises and streams. So, what a deferred is, is, um, let's put it differently. So, we have a promise where you can react the form. Um, that, that's dark. So, there is a promise, and if the promise gets fulfilled with a value or an error, the, clo uh, the closure or the anonymous class interview will be executed asynchronously. So if the promise is fulfilled um, with, with a string or something else, the on success has to get executed. If an error has been raised, so exception has been thrown, this one, this one has to get executed, or there's an on-complete where you just get the promise back and then you need to check if it has been an error or not. You can care. But yes? This is Java 8, this is not Java 8. And why, is, why do you use the, the closure and on complete? I, I could have been used, but I, I thought I've, I've used Java 8 simplex so much in the slides before, I also wanted to show how an anonymous class looks like. I can't? Yeah, I just wanted to know if, if you use them as, a, as an example or you couldn't do... Yeah, I use it as an example, you, you could use closures as well. There was a limitation on the Java 8 implementation of closure that didn't allow you to use the closure there. I, I don't think so. I just wanted to bring up. So you can see it says, I'm good old Java 6 um, with the anonymous class. And one thing to mention here is how do I fulfill that promise? And this is where the deferred comes in. Because what in, in general, what you want to do is you, you create a promise and you pass it on to your consumer, whoever that is. But you don't want to allow him to fulfill your promise. You need to, to put, some, put a value in, in, in the promise in some way and then the consumer gets notified. So what we do is we, we separated those two and we have one thing that we call a deferred, that's in here. And if you call compose on the deferred, you get, you get the, the, the promise that you can pass on to the consumer. And what you will do and what we'll see in the demos is that you actually pass your value into the deferred and then the deferred will notify the promise. The promise has one limitation, um, or by design, you can only fulfill it once. So if you put a value in the promise, be it either success or an error, it, it's done, right? It, you, can't, you can't set a value more than once in the promise. That's the contract. But if you want to do that, you can use streams. They have a very, very similar um, API, or the, the interface is nearly the same. But what you can do is you can put 
more than one value into the stream. And all of your consumers will be executed every time you put something into the stream. And here you can see the nice composability that we have in our, um, we call them composers, it's like for, uh, formatted in streams. So you can say stream dot map, and this is also Java 8. Everything that goes into the stream first gets put into the stream in this uppercase method of, of the stream class, and then the uppercase stream gets returned. And the return stream gets put into the filter method where we, where we apply the predicate and say, oh, only, only that it propagates to the next consumer if the length is greater than five. And in the last consumer, we just print out the line. But very important to know, that all of these steps, they get all executed asynchronously. There, there is no simple blocking code in here, not a single line. And this is very, for the Scala guys, this is very familiar to you. Because you have the composer field in Scala right there. But here we also have this for Java. One, one thing that I want to show code-wise is the processor. Um, I'm not going into much detail here, but it's, it's for those of you who know the LMX Disruptor API, this is basically a, a, a very, very thin, uh, a thin wrapper around the, around the Disruptor, and it gives you a more reactor-ish um, API practices. And the Disruptor works that way that you have a ring buffer that is pre-allocated, so you can keep um, some garbage collection pressure very, very low. So you pre-allocate those objects and you never release them. And what you do is you, you take a sequence out of the ring buffer, you populate it with a new value, and then you publish it back into the ring buffer. And this is uh, just an example how to do it. So we have a ring buffer. We call prepare to get one slice out of our ring buffer. Then we, we do something with the value here. We just, we just do the buffer. Not by maybe, but it's not the, the ring buffer, but it's the, the Java buffer. And then we put the slice back into our ring buffer. And then the consumer gets notified on the other end that it's been fetched. Or we even have batch semantics, which are very, very important if you're dealing with um, network stuff, because we, we can then do um, network batching and get much better things from the data. So we have a, a supplier here that every time the supplier is called, um, append, so it's basically the same operation here. We append something to a, to a Java buffer. And then we, in one batch, 512 slices of a ring buffer get committed into the ring buffer at the same time, and then we can make use of the LMAX disruptor built in batching mechanism to notify the consumers, which is very, very efficient. Who is using Spring? Yeah, some of you. So we, we also have Spring integration, it's a separate module that you put in on top of the core, and it just, in a, in a Spring way, it allows you to, if, if you're using um, Java config in Spring, you can say enable reactor and you get all of the environments set up for you. You can just annotate your, your beans and you get those, um, you, spend, you get the, the consumers, you can wire them in your, uh, in your beans and all this kind of thing. So it's, it's very handy. And it also features another executor, which is called the dispatcher task executor, which is not intended for high scale, but it allows you to run your Spring components uh, in the same thread as the reactor consumers, which in some cases may be handy. Um, just keep it in mind, if you're using Spring, we have very good integration. Who is using Groovy? No one here? I, I don't do either. Um, but I just wanted to bring it up. Um, since the, the Pivot guys, they also do a lot of Groovy and Gray, of course, it has um, very good Groovy integration for Pivot. Closure, anyone? Oh, one, one guy. Great. Um, there is a, a, a wrapper library on top of Reactor, which is called Meltdown, and it gives a very closure-esque syntax on, on top of the whole Reactor. So if you're using closure, you may want to check it out, and it's, it's easier to work with. What else, before we jump into the demo? We have TCP client and server based on Nelly 4 that I'm using very extensively uh, at Couchbase. We have very good buffer tooling to, to handle raw buffers we use with, uh, uh, with keeping memory copies um, at a minimum to make sure it's performant. We have sequencing uh, for event ordering. We have virtual support on top of Java Chronicle, which is also a very high performance library used in high frequency trading. Mm. A logback appender, which you can use, which is it's basically a, a specific logback appender, which gives you much, much better performance than the default appender that you can use a logback. And some other language constructs that are shipped with it that you may know from languages like Scala. So we have Drupal, 
and we have the compo the composable like means and, and uh, stream promises that we've seen before. So I have one question. Yes. I don't get the, what is the integration between Nessie and Reactor. Okay. So maybe it, it so it will get clearer. I have some examples on that one. But what what we basically do is we wrap Nessie and provide you a, a very a reactor-ish interface on top of Nessie. So so. Like we, we create a stream here on top of all of the spec, we can do the same. Um, you, you specify the environment and what we do is we we override the net environment with our own so we can make sure they get executed in the same thread and, and this kind of thing. So we do some magic, but in, in general we, we abstract Nessie out of your way. So if you write something into the TCP client, for example, you, you would get a uh, you would get a promise back. Which, which is not the case if you're using raw netty because then you need to write your own, uh, you need your own inbound handler and you need to make sure that the requests and the responses get mapped and these kind of things. So, so we, we take care of that for you. We, we also map exceptions. So, any more questions before we jump into the demo? And I think with the demo, things get much more clear. Okay? <coughs> So, can anyone read the code even from the last rows, yeah. or should I make it a little larger? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So the first thing that we, that we we will do is we will we will play around with promises. So, as you can see, we create the environment and we just keep it static for some simplicity reasons. And. Here we use a thing that's called the boundary, um, which is nothing more than a wrap around the consumer. Um, who, who is, who of you is um, doing asynchronous code on, on JVM with Java, with futures and these kind of things? Yeah, so what you will do most of the time is call await, and then you have to deal with interrupts and these kind of things, and the boundary takes care of this for you. Um, just to see things. So here we are creating our deferred. You can see we give it the environment in, in where we want to run our promise, the, the asynchronous callback. And out of the promise, out of the deferred, we create the promise. So, and, and this is a very, very common concept. You, you will, will always do this if you're dealing with uh, streams and, and promises. And here we define some uh, callbacks on our promise. On complete, we, we, we say, oh, print complete promises with the promise on success, we say success of value, and so on. And then we put something into our promise. We say, on the deferred accept, which is the term to say, now let's fulfill that promise with, with a value. And here we give it hello world. But as you can see, there is also the accept of a throwable. So if we put here, if we put here throw exception something, the on error method will be executed. So we can see two of our callbacks got executed, the first one, the complete one, and the success one. Now let's change it to completing our promise with a throwover. The promise got, oops, this is the promise. Yeah, and here is, here is our our own error message because I'm, I'm printing into system error, so it's, it's called red. So here we got go through it. it. It doesn't make much sense in this case, but if you can think of, if you think about chaining those uh, consumers after one each other, it could very well be that 
one of those steps throws an exception because you're trying to pass JSON and it doesn't work. So then the exception gets populated through all of your consumers and then you can add a special consumer which handles these errors and does something with it. And that's very, very handy if you're building those tree structures because you as a developer can choose where I want to deal with my with my error, where I want to deal with my exception. So then let's try something else. As the, the method said, it's called double complete. And what we're trying to do here is we're doing except twice. So, and I hope it should fail because it tells us the promise has already complete. So we can only we can only complete our, our promise once with the first. If we want to do that more than once, we can use the stream. And here it's it's again it's the same. We instead of creating a promise, we create a stream. We have our deferred, and if we call compose, we get our actual stream. Here we have a consumer attached to it that says, if I get this message, then I, I print out. And we put two strings into our, str into our deferred. We got two messages here. So what you can do with it is it's very handy. You can you can build that by consumer chain. So for example, in the in the Java client, what we do is we want to walk the REST API of our server on the client side. So I basically chain those consumers together. The first one um, asks the web server, returns the string with the JSON, then I pass on the JSON to the next consumer, which handles the JSON mapping to a poacher, which checks it, and then I pass the poacher on to the next one. So and all of those get um, executed asynchronously and I don't have to care about resource management, logging, all these kind of things. Let's look more sophisticated rules. I, I want to talk about this more. So here we have our stream. It has two consumers attached to it. The first one uses a function. Here we're using string to uppercase. Um, which is a nice sh shorthand in Java 8, but let me show you how it would look like in the Java 6 with the new function. Return string. That is exactly the same. So <coughs> we have our map function, which maps the string um, to see that the strings got uppercased and then passed on uppercase to the next consumer completely asynchronous. So the last one I want to show you is the is filtering of values. So here we are using the predicate and there you can see the Java 8 syntax of the predicate that one of you asked previously. Um, it looks like this. And if the string that we get contains the word deffest, we pass it on to the next consumer. And here we pass in hello world and hello deffest. And hopefully it should only print out hello deffest. So you can really build your consumer chains and, and do anything what you want with them and get them working completely asynchronously. So any questions so far on the promises and streams? Okay. Then Let's move on to the React Assembly. Let's start with the simple reactor first. So here we create our reactor. We say, use the environment, the static one used here, new environment. Use the dispatch ring buffer, so all of our consumers will be executed in the ring buffer. If we want to use a thread pool, we can just say thread pool and we've executed a thread pool on the environment. So the important thing here really is that our consumers have no idea where they get executed and how. And this is called location transparency, which is something that's very, very important in, um, in, re in, in reactive systems. 
Because in theory, if you extend the reactor and you make it um, network aware or um, you, you can cluster it in some way like, yeah, like you could do an actor with actor, um, the consumer could be executed on another server. If, if you wanted to, the consumer has no idea where to get it. Okay? So here we create a reactor and on the on method, our topic is test. And if we get notified here, we, we just print it out. And probably the, the dollar is just the method call with the strange name? Yeah, it's a shorthand. So we, we have selectors. Yeah, so it, it's a shorthand. Um, there is also the, I think there is a selector. There is a, a, a bunch of selectors that you can use. There's the dollar sign, which, which is like, uh, except the string, but then there is also the, the R shorthand, which uh, takes a, regu a regular expression, the T for a class type. So this is very handy if you if you want to react on um, exceptions, for example. Then you could say T and then exception dot class, and your consumer would always be executed when an exception is raised inside your consumer. Then we have your right template. So it, it's just a shorthand. I think if 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 you jump into the class. You can see that it's 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 just it's a short it's really a shorthand to say new regex select and then pass into regex. So you could do new selector here and then, but it's it's really just we're, we're trying to keep it short and simple. But it's it looks strange to to Java eyes in some ways, right? So here is the the same consumer with um, Java Java six. We have a consumer who gets an event, and he, on when, when the event is passed into the consumer, um, the selector matches, and then the accept method is called. So this is exactly the same. And we notify a consumer, we have step fest, we pass it in. Run it, hopefully. It says hi step fest. So and we, we can do that as, as often as we want to. What you can also do is, uh, I don't have an example here, but the reactor, if you, when you, when you put the consumer into your reactor, you get a registration back. And what you can do is on, on, on the fly, you can add and remove consumers during a run. This is very helpful if, if you, for example, with the Couchbase, we have nodes where we dispatch our operations to, but it could be that one of those nodes is failing. So we can just take out the consumer and then just avoid that we send operations to that node. Or you can even pause the registration to say, oh, for the next five seconds, for whatever reason, I don't want this consumer to, to get notified on the topics because it's it's completely valid to create another to create another consumer on the same topic, of course. So and, and he does something else. So you, you can define as much as consumers as you want on the same topic. Another nice feature of the reactor, which allows it to be um, chains, is that you can define um, headers on your events. So let, let's just do it quickly. So here we have our reactor as before. And instead of saying on, we say receive. And the receive method takes the selector as before. We are using the templates here. And it takes a function. And what happens there is, in our function, we, we can react on the event that we get, but we return an event. And if we return it, what happens with it, um, it's pretty easy to answer. When we put an event, when we put an event into our reactor, we can use headers, we can set, set reply to, and then another topic. So what happens here is our first our first consumer takes the event and passes out the city. So, uh, for example, Vienna or Barcelona passes the city. If the city equals Vienna, it, it returns always raining, and if it's Barcelona, it says sunny. And if it doesn't know the city, it throws an exception. And then we have another consumer, which listens on weather status, just a regular consumer, and prints out the weather. So what happens here is we send into our reactor, we say weather Vienna with an event, and then, hey, and if you're done, please reply to this topic, weather, 
status. So what happens is we pass in weather Vienna, it goes into this function, it returns always raining, and the result value always gets, uh, gets put back into the reactor, notifies this topic, and then executes this <coughs> consumer. So you can really build your consumer chains on top of it. So we did one for Vienna and Barcelona. And let's put one in there, Munich, which doesn't know about. The exception is raised, and nothing happens. So our consumer, or our function here, throw this illegal argument exception but nothing happens. And this is, this is really the challenge with highly asynchronous applications because this exception gets raised on a thread that has nothing to do with our current execution context. So what reactor allows us to do, and now we can make use of the, of the um, selector where we can select some class properties. We can see every time an exception gets put into the reactor, we can, we can react. So if we run this, Our reactor here says, I can handle, I don't know, Munich. And then you can do something with it in there. You can either dispatch something else, you can remove consumers, re you can re-add them. So it's, it's really up to you how to handle those errors. And it's completely asynchronous. So now I'm, go I'm going to show you the processor. And this is a, a little different from the regular um, consumers and, and streams and, and <coughs> Sorry, streams and promises, but I want to show you because I want to show you how the performance looks like of these things. Um, the processor, as I mentioned previously, is, is nothing more than a, a very lightweight wrapper around the Edmax disruptor. And this is the same thing that is used when you use the um, ring buffer dispatcher. So here we create our processor. Um, I won't go into much detail how it looks like. Um, just we create it, and what we do then is for the number of runs specified, I think there's 10, 10 million runs. For the million runs, we take something out of the ring buffer, then we, we just, basically it's I++, plus plus, so, so we, we increment it, we put it in there, and then we commit it. And then we, we wait until it, how long it takes to, to do the 10 million operations. So, and then we just count how long it takes. So, let's first do it operation by operation. So for 10 million operations, we get a throughput of what was that, five, uh, or roughly 6 million operations per second. So that's not, not, not too shabby. But if we do this in batching, and this is the, the nice thing about the ring buffer, because it can notify our consumers much, much more intelligent if we do batch, batch processing. So it's, it's the same operation, but we don't do it one by one, but we do 512 of those operations same time, we get around 21 million operations per second. Okay, and this is very important if you're dealing with um, like like we do at Couchbase. I, I need to make sure that if you have traffic, if you have um, traffic spikes, like see your your web application hits a traffic spike and you need to make a lot of uh, requests against the database, I can batch them together and send them over the network at the same time to get lower latency and better throughput. Completely transparent. And if you use this approach, it does it for you. We, we, just, we just need to put it in there and then our consumers get notified on top of that. So any question, and I know it's quick, but it, it's just too much to show. Any questions about the processor and the NMAX disruptor? Otherwise, I only have two more examples to show you, which are more real world examples. The first one is how, how you could potentially work a REST API. So completely asynchronously. So in here we, we use the we use um, the native TCP wrapper. So we use REST TCP modules. We create a stream and I, 
I just do one REST block, so I, I ask the web server, get the response back, pass it, and then do something with it. But you could, you can very easily just put more web functions in there, but I wanted to keep it short for now. So our first step is the connect function, which connects connects to the web server. Step one then takes this URI and asks for a response, and step two then takes the response that you get and does something with it. And the last consumer just prints out what, what we got. So, and the only thing we, we put here into the RTF thread is localhost, which is the, the thread. Now, lo now let's look at the different functions. Here's our connect function, it implements function. It takes a string, which is localhost, and it returns the TCP connection to the next one in our, in our uh, map, in our stream. So we use Netty TCP here. Our TCP client, we use the HTTP codec of Netty to, to make sure we can pass uh, HTTP responses. And all we need to do is await. And we can block here in this, we can block here in this function because we're using the thread pool environment. So I know that if I block in my consumer here, one thread will be blocked for the time it takes to open the, the connection, but the other thing will, will execute as well. And once this consumer is fulfilled, we either throw an exception or we just pass on the connection to the next consumer. And the next consumer, not very surprisingly, takes the connection that we got from the first one, and then we use send and receive, that, that's a method on our um, TCP client. We send um, the request, which goes to slash pools, which is an REST API, and on success, they, they can see the, the promise pattern again. We, we say on success, take our response from Netty and pass it into the stream, uh, into the stream. And for those who've been in the last talk about testing, this is very, very nice to test because normally when, when you have sequencing code uh, where you connect and then you do something and then you do the next thing, it's very hard to, to break them out and then you have private methods and how you deal with it. But here, you can test each of those steps individually. So I just, the contract is in my connect function. It takes a string and it gives you a TCP connection back. And, and you, can, you, can, you can write a lot of tests on top of those assumptions. And your next function just takes a TCP connection and returns the content. And what you would do here is you would just mock the TCP connection, pass it in. You, on the mock, on the mock, you give it a specific JSON response, and then you can very, very easily assert on this JSON request I get an exception, or on this JSON request I expect this response. So this very, very much aids um, also test-driven development and easy testing. And the third step here takes the JSON, uh, the, the JSON, the, the pojo. Sorry, it takes the JSON string and maps it onto a pojo. And here, I'm, I'm making it easy for here. Uh, I just have a, this is just a, a class, a, a final class, <laughs> which has two properties, which map to, to the, the JSON response. And then I pass in this pojo to the next step. And the last step here just prints out the last step. So if we run this, It says, now go look at this URI. What happened? So if I go to localhost 891 pools, which is our REST API. Apparently I can't make it. I can't stop. Here, we, this is the part that in our culture we, we take out. Here is this, this URI that got fetched asynchronously here. And then I can go, oh, now I'm going to do the next request on this URI, fetch the data out. So we can, we can work our REST API in a completely asynchronous manner. And if you think about it, we can pass in a lot of messages here. So we can do this on localhost, but we can also do it on another node at the same time. And those consumers, they, they don't know about each other. They just do their work. And we can make sure that how, it doesn't matter how many, how many uh, walks we do at the same time, the environment makes sure that all the thread pool gets, um, gets used as, as the best and performance as possible. And the last thing I want to show throughput wise is another very practical example. So 
what we do is now we're going to talk with our Couchbase server directly. Um, we use the TCP client and we're dealing with raw byte buffers. We open three connections to localhost on port 11210, which is the, the binary port where we do operations. We use the ring buffer dispatcher on our reactor and then we have three consumers. We say when a byte buffer gets put into our reactor, the consumer, which here is called node, gets this byte buffer and then sends the stuff over to the server. So here we do some byte buffer magic, which just constructs a, a request basically against the server. And then we do, I don't know, 10 million times or so to the, the query. Here we are doing notify on the byte buffer, and then we, we create a byte buffer, notify our consumers, and how does a node look like? It's very easy. The node gets the data, copies it into a cache, and then once the, the batch size here is, is full, it will throw it on the wire. It uses send, and then it waits until it's written properly, and then it waits for the next message to accept. So let's go to our user interface. So this is our debug bucket. So we, we have, in Couchbase, we have real-time analytics here. And if we run this code, and the demo code that I put with the interface, we can see that we're basically up to 100,000K, so we have around 1 million operations per second against my local Couchbase node. And if we profile the same code, we get around, because the profile is running, it's not so, not so constant, but we still get 900,000 operations per second. And you can see our CPU is around 10%. And this is just because of our batching that we did in our consumer and of the ring buffer, which is so performant to dispatch events to it. So we have 10% load, and we get around 1 million operations per second against our database. Okay? Just, I just wanted to show you that it's not just talking that this works really great, it actually works really great, and it allows you to very, very easily create completely asynchronous applications on top of the JVM. And yeah, thanks so far. Any questions? I think we have four or five minutes left. Or do you already want to go to the after party? All right, so thanks everyone. And just no hit me up. Yeah. No question. You said you were going to talk about couch basis. I would, I would say, in your opinion, about what is not that biased because you work on couch basis. What, what is what is the biggest differentiation between uh, is MongoDB something similar to couch base? <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. Definitely. So we are a document-oriented database. But we can take this discussion offline if you're interested. Okay. I mean, I, I can talk 10 hours about couch if you want, but um, it, it's another topic. Um, just let's stop here. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the after party. <laughs>